first, first of all, thank you very much for coming all the way from Paris to be here. Is this your first time in Dallas? Hello, everybody. Thanks Never for coming tonight. Thank you. This is actually my first time in Dallas. Not my first time in the USA, but my first time here. But I'm not going to get to see much of it, right. as you know, because I'm going to be on a plane very soon. But I'm very glad to be here tonight. Yeah. We are literally what she's going to see of Dallas. This is it. So <laughs> make it good, OK? <laughs> Because she's going to leave, and whatever impression we make tonight, that's it. So, uh, this is a beautiful film, an absolutely beautiful film. And and we were talking earlier, and I think it's safe to say that you're pleased with the end result. I mean, that's one of the, th the trickiest things, I think, for any author, is when a, their book gets picked up to be made into a film, usually there's a lot of changes made. You never know if it's going to end up looking or feeling the way that you wanted it to. What was your feeling when you first saw the finished product, Sarah's Kate? First, I have a question for all of you here. I just want to know um, if any of you have read my book. Could you please raise your hands? Okay, great. All right. Um, when I was told that this book was going to become a movie, this was uh, probably in 2007, just when the movie came out in France. The book came out in France, rather. So I was very excited about that. I was also worried because I felt that maybe I would not recognize my, my Sarah, my Julia. But I met very early on with Gilles Paquet-Brenner, who's the young director of this movie, and I immediately trusted him because he was very clear about how he wanted to respect my book. And those of you who have read it, even though you know that there have been several cuts, as you can see, it is very faithful to my book. And also I was included ever since the beginning. I read the, the, the script. Um, I was on the set, my children played in the Vendif scenes, I have a small cameo part, you know the, the part where she, Julia tells her husband that she's pregnant in the restaurant, I'm just behind her shoulder, well you didn't know me then, but maybe <laughs> all my friends noticed that, that was very exciting, uh, that was my five minutes of glory, um, anyway, so it was really very emotional seeing this come to life, and I think the the most emotional part for me was meeting Melusine, who's the little girl who plays Sarah. And I think you, you all agree here today that she's a tremendous actress. And she reminds me a little of a, you know, a, yes, please clap. And I'm going to tell her. <laughs> she's so cute. And she's become a very dear friend. And uh, she reminds me of, you know, young Jodie Foster or Dakota Fanning. That kind of actress, you don't even want to say that she's a child actress, she's an actress. And I think that meeting her for the first time, when I went on the, the set for the Verdive scenes, and this little girl comes up to me and says, uh, Bonjour, I'm your Sarah. Imagine how I felt. So that was very emotional. And of course, when I saw the movie for the first time, um, I saw it about a year ago, and it didn't have the music it wasn't edited the way you saw it tonight, but it was very close. And I think I probably cried for about three hours because it is an emotional movie. It, it's a beautiful movie, I think. And uh, so, yes, I mean, I wouldn't be sitting here today if I didn't like the movie. I wouldn't have come all the way from Paris, France just to meet you guys, although I'm sure you're all very nice. Um, I, I know that this book has done very well in America. I think now I've been told that there are three million readers in America, which is enormous. Uh, well, you can thank, thank Martin, uh, St. Martin's Press, my wonderful publishers, who uh, have been doing a great job. But also, I think that the movie business is very difficult here in the States, and um, especially with Harry Potter coming out practically the same week, and you know, some of the big... So I think this movie needs all the help it can get, and that's why I'm here. I'm, uh, I'm here not to sell more books. I've sold a lot of those already. Um, I'm here to help Gilles promote this beautiful film, because I think he's done a really fantastic job. Yeah. What's this Harry Potter you're talking about? I, um, I did want to ask you how much of you is in this movie, because I know with your background in publishing and working for various magazines and things like that, there's a lot of Kristen Scott Thomas's character that, you know, just knowing what I know about you, I would think, like, this is a lot of you in this as well. Can you talk a little bit about how personal the story is in, in terms of your own personal experiences? Well, all my readers think that I'm Julia Jarman, so I'm so sorry, guys. I'm not. I'm French. You know, when I wrote this book about eight years ago now, um, I modeled her on all my expat 
American friends who've married Frenchmen, who've never lost their accents, and who love Paris. And they're all mentioned in the back of the book. Charla, Jan, Carol, they're all there. I love them, they're great. But they're my American friends. So readers were asking me questions like, oh, so um, now you're divorced. And how's your daughter Zoe? And I was like, wait a minute, you know. Hello, writers have imagination, you know. I am, I am not Julie Darman. And, um, but that's, you know, writers get that a lot. Any book you write, and luckily a secret kept my most recent book, The Hero is a Man, so I don't get that quite so much now. But I, I guess you could say that what we have in common is the same age, um, the same job, a journalist. And I think what I conveyed to Julia is the, the horror that I felt uh, when I discovered the truth about the Valive, I mean the details of it. That's what I gave her, um, that quest, trying to find the truth. And maybe I, maybe I would have done that had I moved into an apartment that, that had such a dark story. But obviously all the personal, the personal side to Julia's life is not mine. And Bertrand, by the way, is modeled on an ex-boyfriend of mine. <laughs> and my readers will have noticed that he's much nastier in the book and much more pleasant in the movie. And that was Gilles paquet Brenner's choice. Uh, I think, okay, I went with that. But in my book, I'd say he's much sexier and probably rather misogyne, as we'd say, and not a very nice husband to have. And luckily, my husband, the wonderful Nicola, has nothing to do with Bertrand, so please be relieved. That is not at all my life, so that's about it. <laughs> And we were talking earlier, A Secret Kept has been picked up for a movie. You have uh, four different books that have been picked up for films. Um, but at the, at the moment, what is the status of that in terms of whether or not we will see? Because this was a movie that obviously you know, started, had its origins over in France and then came over here. What are the, what, what, where is A Secret Kept, I guess is what I'm asking, in terms of will we get to see that at the same time that you get to see that? Well, for the moment, it's still very young. We just sold the rights. And now I know because it's happened with Sarah's Key that this does take take time. That you know the script needs to be written, and then the producers need to get all the money, because movies are always about money. It's kind of sad, isn't it? But that's the truth behind it. So it took. I think we signed for Sarah's Key in 2007, and look, the movie's just coming out now. So it does take a while. So a secret kept, hopefully, um, if it does come to America, which I would love, uh, probably won't be for another three years. But then I, I guess I'll come back. <laughs> Well, you know, make sure and tell all your friends to go see this because that's a good way to get people, you know, familiarized with Tatiana's work. I did want to make sure that we get to some questions from the audience. So if you want to raise your hand, I'll call on you. I'll start with you, sir, because I saw your hand first. Can you tell me your question? I just want to know if the French government participated in the expense of producing the film. The, the question was, did the French government participate in the expense of producing the film? Uh, no, not at all. No. Is that a disappointment to you? Yeah, no, they didn't. What language do you write in? It depends. Um, I wrote Sarah's Key in English, Secret Kept in English, and my latest book, which you will read next year, hopefully, called The House I Loved, is in English. But I've also written a, very many books in French. So that's the problem, being half French, half English. You know, that's The book just comes to you in a given language. For the moment, the English streak is coming out. My mother's very happy about that. <laughs> She's the English one. Um, but maybe in a couple of years I'll go back to French and maybe one day I'll write a book in, which is in French and in English, but that'd be maybe not very commercial, not a very good idea. Mm. Uh, right back over here. Yes, was there any collaboration between you and the screenwriter? How did that work? Was there any collaboration between you and the screenwriter? How did that work? Well, actually, Serge Joncourt, that's the person who wrote the script, is, happens to be a friend of mine. Um, He's a writer as well, and he's a wonderful person. And we share the same birth year, um, 1961, which is also Obama's birth year, isn't it? So it's a big year for Obama and me. We're going to be the same age. And you know what that is, so I'm not going to say what that age is. But anyway, Serge and I share that. He's also a very, um, very talented writer. And we, we're interested in the same themes. And Gilles Paquet-Brenner had already worked with him on a movie called UV based on one of Serge's books. So when I found out that Serge was gonna be writing the script, I immediately felt, um, you know, I, I was, I trusted him. And I was given, there were two different scripts, not 
not very different actually in their structure, but perhaps in you know a couple of details and what he decided to keep in the book or not. And I was always told that if I didn't like something or if there was an element that bothered me, I could change that. But to tell you the truth, there's nothing that I didn't like um, in the script. So I ended up telling him how much I did like it. And, uh, and I think he did a fabulous job. And, um, and he's also a very, very, very wonderful person. And um, I wish he could be here tonight. He didn't speak very good English, but I could, I could have translated for him. Maybe next time I'll bring him along. Uh, right back over here. Yes, ma'am. How popular is your book over in France with the Muslim? Okay, yeah. I was repeating for the people back there because they may not hear. How popular the book is in France because the Muslim population is growing and a lot of people aren't aware of what happened. Oh my God, are we done? No. <laughs> well, we'll get those back. Um, the book is just as popular in France as it is in America, and so was the film. So um, I think it's had a, a very strong career. Uh, this book is now published in, I think, 40 countries. Um, and the film is going through many of those countries. So I think that a lot of people in France do know about the Holocaust because we are taught about it in school now, which was not the case when I grew up in France 20 years ago. But it is now taught in every single school in France, which is not the case in England, for example. So in France, there are history classes about the Veldiv and just for, for kids aged 15 and 17, so people do know about it. So I hope that answers your question because I don't, unfortunately, cannot answer you about the Muslim population because although I know that they're growing and that they're there, um, this hasn't stopped the book from being read and from being appreciated, at least from the emails and letters I've been getting or contact with my readers when I go to book fairs in France. I saw one right here, yes. Where did you get oh, there we go. Was there a story about this being a child that you kind of, you know, heard or was all tragic and I mean, I know this is like a short little friction fiction, but there's something that made you do that? What was the inspiration for the key and the child in the story? Well, that's my imagination, you know. Um, I do have a lot of it, but I also have two children called Louis and Charlotte who are now 21 and 19, but when I started to write this book nearly 10 years ago now, they were therefore 10 years younger, and they used to play a lot, hide and seek, hiding in cupboards, and pretending that, of course we'd pretend that we never you know, knew where they were, well of course we knew they were in the cupboard. Like, where are Louis, where's Charlotte, oh they're hiding. Um, and I think it's the mother in me that felt so horrified by the fate of these 4,000 Veldiv children, that's what sparked the desire to write about this book because nobody seemed to really know the details of the Roundup and how it happened. And I think that Sarah, um, when she saw the French police come that morning, you know, this was not the Nazis coming to get her, so she probably thought that she was coming back. And I really tried to put myself into my daughter's eyes, and Charlotte was 10 at that time, exactly Sarah's age. And I think that's what she may have done. Um, she really probably would have thought that she was coming back, and I, and I think that even though I've never read any single story about this, I think it could have happened, unfortunately. I think it could have happened. In the red shirt? Well, you know that speech by um, Chirac, Jacques Chirac, that I mentioned in the book and that you see in the movie, in that rather moving moment when 
adult Sarah uh, is walking towards the sea. Um, that speech in 1995 really made headlines because it was the first time that a French president acknowledged the role of the French police. So that's probably the first time in my life that I heard the word Veldiv Roundup, Rafle du Veldiv. So of course I knew that it took place during the war. But then again, what I didn't know were the details. The, the exact role of the French police, how the Roundup was organized, and especially the fact that the Nazis had not asked for the children. That it was the French police who arrested those children. Um, and that was something that we were absolutely not taught. Of course, the Jewish community aware of this and knew the details. But the taboos and the scars that have, that have surrounded this event are so strong in my country that you can get to 40 years old and not know about it, which is amazing when you think about it and, and disturbing. And even if it is taught now in schools, it all depends on how the history teacher teaches it to you. The teacher can spend five minutes saying this is what happened, 13,000 Jewish people were rounded up, put into the Vélodrome d'Hiver, sent off, whatever. Or the teacher can take one day and you will see that the children will therefore understand and see everything that happened in the movie. So um, I think that this book has perhaps help younger generations, um, because I know it's read a lot by teenagers in France, and in fact, it's read it in schools. And by the amount of emails I've been getting from uh, American teachers, I have a feeling all of a sudden it's being read a, a lot by uh, kids who must be um, 12 or 13 or 14, so I don't know what grade that is in here, probably, okay. So now I'm swamped by demands from teachers. I've had to put, create a new thing on my website to say that you know, I can't answer everybody. But I'm glad that these young children are reading it and enjoying it and learning from it because that's something I certainly didn't expect when I, when I wrote it. OK, we'll take two more questions. Let's make them real quick. We'll go right here first. What do you know about the Holomodor in the Ukraine that happened after the war? What do you know about the Holomodor that happened in the Ukraine after the war? I'm afraid I know nothing about it. Can you tell me? Basically, when Stalin took over, they took all the food from the peasants, and there was a starvation that equaled the massacre of the Holocaust itself. And it's an untold story an author like you might want to research. Well, I certainly will look into it. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we'll go, let's see, one last one. Did I get anybody back here? Did any of y'all have any questions? Okay, anybody else over here? No one wants the last question? Okay, right here. I want to know in real life what happened to the children that had to stay in that camp. What did happen in real life to the children that had to stay in the camp? They were about, there were 4,000 children, about 2,000 in bonne la rolande and 2,000 in Pithiviers, which was right next door. They were sent back to Drancy, which was another camp just outside of Paris, alone, because they'd been separated from their parents, as you saw. Then they remained in Drancy for about two or three days. These children were aged between two and 12. And then they were sent on trains to Auschwitz directly, alone, mingled with adults so that nobody could say, here's a train full of children. And once they got to Auschwitz, they were sent immediately to the gas chamber. So not one of the Veldiv children ever came back, except the ones who, of course, like Sarah, escaped um, from either bef just before the roundup, meaning they hid or were hidden by a, a neighbor or somebody who helped them, or escaped from the Veldiv, or escaped from bonne la But otherwise, not one of those children ever came back. And on such a sad note, but that's <laughs> what happened. Uh, I also want to suggest that you all check out uh, Tatiana's website. It's tatianaderosne.com. Yeah.
and uh, you're on Facebook as well. And there's a lot of information on your website about you and about where you're going to be and what you're doing and what you have coming up. Anything else you want to tell people? Yes, I wanted to say I'm really sorry not to be able to sign all your books tonight, but I'm so tired. But I'm very glad that I was able to actually articulate and say something because when I got off the plane about an hour ago, I really thought that I was going to fall asleep. <laughs> um, but I wanted to say that uh, I do communicate with my readers on my Facebook page and on my Twitter page, and I do answer my emails if you like, if you give me a little bit of time. Um, so if you have any extra questions for me, or if you want to just say that you were happy to meet me, uh, you can write to me and I'll do my best to answer. I have a Blackberry and an iPhone, so I have no excuse. And I do this while I'm waiting for trains or planes or stuck in airports to my husband's despair. <laughs> So merci beaucoup. Thank you for being here tonight.